NSA is spying and was spying and uh, we had Snowden, we have a lot of documents to look at and um, there is some new research on how they used geolocation methods in mobile networks. It is done by the University of Hamburg and we have here Eric who will present this research to you. And uh, he has done this for the German government, um, for the NSA uh, Untersuchungsausschuss, which we call NS Aua, which means like um, NS um, Ouch, kind of. Uh, he, has a, he is a PhD student and holds a master in physics. So give him a warm applause. And for those coming later, please go to your seats and try to be quiet. Yeah, thank you. Hello. I'm really happy to have you all here, and I welcome you to my talk about geolocation methods in mobile networks. My name is Eric Sue, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Hamburg. So in the beginning, I want to point out why I'm giving this talk. So... The German Parliamentary Investigative Committee wanted to find out about the German involvement in U.S. drone strikes. And then the German government officials claimed that they do not know anything or they do not know any possibility how to use a phone number for targeting drone strikes. And the investigative committee did not really believe this statement, and so they asked our research group at the University of Hamburg to prepare a report, and we handed in that report to the Bundestag, and it was very soon afterwards also published by Netzpolitik.org. Thank you for that. And... <laughs> And it contains uh, like uh, technical methods and uh, approximates the accuracy to localize mobile phones. And it also points out which technical identifiers are required uh, to conduct such uh, geolocation. Now I give you my agenda for today. First, I will speak about the purpose of geolocation data. And then we are looking into a broad uh, variety of different approaches to conduct such a geolocation in mobile networks. And then we specify on drones and look into the technical methods which can be conducted with drones. And, and then I'm going to point out which technical identifier we, we can use for such a geolocation. And lastly, I'm going to sum up. So the purpose of geolocation data, it is a neutral technology. So we can use it for rescue missions. For example, if somebody got lost in the forest or in the mountains, we can use geolocation data to find that person and rescue the person. Or if you ever use Google traffic, there you can profit from monitoring traffic conditions. But we can also use it to invade the privacy of persons. For example, if we identify people on surveillance footage, or if we track the location of a certain individual over a longer period. And certainly we, we can use, it, use these data for targeting drone strikes. However, I want to point out that these data, they are, not, they are not suitable to prove the identity of a person. So if somebody is conducting a drone strike based on these data, then he is actually not knowing who he is going to kill. So on the right side, you see an image of an explosion site from a Hellfire missile. A Hellfire missile is usually used from uh, by these drones and uh, you can approximate that the blast radius is around 20 meters 
So uh, we, we would consider a targeted drone strike if we have a geolocation me method which can determine the position of a person more precise than 20 meters in radius. So uh, the first approach which I want to present are time measurements. And the symbol which you see down there, it's a base station for, for the next couple of slides. And a base station, and th this is the point in, in a mobile network where your phone connects to. And uh, you, on the slides, you can certainly interchange uh, this base station with an MC catcher. An MC catcher is something like a, face, a fake base station from a third party, and you could even build it yourself. So the method used to calculate the position of a phone is for time measurements, triliteration. You have to know that, that the signal is usually traveling with, the, or is traveling with the speed of light. So when you measure the time, you can also measure the distance. And here, there are three methods present, presented. The, these are time of arrival, where the signal moves from the handphone to the three base stations, and the accuracy is between 50 and 200 meters. This really depends on the cell size, and it can be more precise or less precise. So then we have time difference of arrival, which is like a round-trip measurement. And we have an enhanced observed time difference where the mobile phone actually computes the location within the mobile and within the cell. And the accuracy is between 50 to 125 meters. So, and the next method which I want to present are angular measurements. When you conduct angular measurements, then you determine the direction of arrival from the signal and afterwards, you do a calculation, which is called triangulation. And therefore, you have to know the position of the base station, but also the alignment of your antenna. And for this method, there are certainly two base stations or MZ catchers sufficient to determine the position of the mobile phone. The accuracy is usually in field experiments between 100 and 200 meters. And the challenge for this method, but also for the ones on the previous slides, is that on normal, normal mobile cells, you don't have a line of sight to each base station from your mobile phone. And so the, the signal gets disturbed by buildings in the way, and then the accuracy becomes worse. So the next method I want to show you, I think most of you will know a little bit about GPS and how it's uh, calculated. So uh, satellites, uh, GPS satellites, broadcast their time and their position. And uh, the mobile phone uses, again, triliteration to calculate its uh, position. And the accuracy is usually below 10 meters, but uh, it depends a little bit on the ship set within uh, the mobile phone. And then the base station can request the position of the phone by issuing a radio re or by issuing a request with the radio resource location service protocol. So another method which I want to present is the mining of internet traffic. Some smartphones send GPS coordinates or the names of nearby Wi-Fi networks, which are also called SSIDs to online services. And usually, these allow the determination of the position around or below 10 meters. And it is certainly possible to intercept this traffic and evaluate the geolocation. So here I have two quotes for you. The first one, it effectively means that anyone using Google Maps on a smartphone is working in support of a GCHQ system. This quote uh, comes from this known archive and uh, was issued in the year 2008. 
So, so we certainly see that, that uh, there is some proof that at least at those days, the, they inter or s some third parties intercepted those traffic and used it for determining the geolocation. And if you wa want to work with uh, determine the location with the SSIDs, it is necessary that you have a map where certain Wi-Fi access points are located. And uh, therefore, we have also something like a, like a proof that, that uh, this has been done by the NSA, and this is the mission Victory Dance, where, where they are mapping the Wi-Fi fingerprint in every major town in Yemen. And in Yemen, also a lot of drone strikes are conducted. So let's go to the next method. <laughs> Signal system number seven is a protocol which is used for communication between network providers. And network providers need to know where, in which cell a mobile phone is located to, uh, to enable the communication. And these informations are saved in location registers. And a third party can easily request these location informations. I want uh, to refer to the talk by Tobias Engel, which uh, he gave a talk two years ago, which really goes into the details of this method. And may maybe if you like to, there are also commercial surface, uh, services available uh, to access uh, this data. So let's talk about drones. We do not have very solid proofs that geolocationing or geolocation methods are conducted by drones, but we have certainly hints. A hint is this Gilgamesh system, which is based on the Predator drones and is a method for active geolocation, which describes an MC catcher. So, but if anybody of you has access to more documents, yeah, it would be nice to have a look. So, <laughs> so the, the easiest method would be certainly to request for GPS coordinates. And, and there you just replace the base station with a drone. But and the, the, measurement, uh, the method which is uh, better, or w which I think is uh, the preferred one, are angular measurements. Angular measurements, uh, measurements, if you have a look in our report, there we approximated that uh, the accuracy of these methods are between 5 and 35 meters in radius from an altitude of 2 kilometers. And if you get closer to the mobile phone, it becomes more accurate. So it would be, to some extent, to be sufficient to, to conduct a targeted drone strike on this data. And in the meantime, since this report was handed over to the Bundestag, I also found other work which described that they are able to achieve an accuracy of one meter from three kilometers altitude for small airplanes. You have to know that those sensors to measure the, the, angle, the angle of arrival, they are usually located within the wings and within the front of the phone. And when the phone uh, plane, and when the plane becomes larger, it's also easier to have a more accurate measurement. Then I want to point out that a single measurement can, can be sufficient to determine the location of a mobile phone if we can assume that the target is on the ground. So if you assume that, that the target is maybe in a building in Yemen, so a single measurement would be sufficient on a, on a low building in Yemen. And a skyscraper would be more difficult. So, and the big advantage of these me methods is that environmental parameters have a very low influence since we, we can have an almost line of sight, or, which allows a better accuracy. So, now I'm going to talk about the identifiers which can be used for geolocation. 
certainly the phone number, and each MC catcher or base station can request um, can issue an identity request to a mobile phone, and then receive the MC or EMI. The MC is something like a unique description for a certain customer in the, the mobile network. And the EMI is like a unique serial number for, for a device. So when we include those methods of mining internet traffic, then, then we can also add a lot of more identifier, for example, an Apple ID or Android ID, Mac address, even cookies or usernames. If you are interested in this, you, you can uh, have a look at the link I provided there, that there's a very interesting paper about this. So I come to my last slide, my summary. I showed you multiple diff um, a lot of different methods to localize a mobile phone, and I pointed out that a single drone can localize a mobile phone with an accuracy which is sufficient to conduct a targeted drone strike. Since uh, this uh, document was handed over to the Bundestag, they also never denied that uh, these methods uh, can be used for, for the, or that, that the ac accuracy of these methods uh, is, is true. So, then I pointed out that uh, as an identifier, the phone number, the MC, and the, the email each can, can be used for uh, the geolocation of a mobile phone. And the last information which I want to give you is that geolocation methods cannot prove the identity of a person. And this is really important to know that we are not... Yeah, that, that when we conduct or when somebody is conducting these drone strikes, that they are not aware who is actually using the phone. And so it can happen that they are killing the wrong person. So, I thank you very much. I thank my colleagues and my family and everybody. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. It's the first talk we have here today where we can have a lot of questions. So, Come on, you have the microphones, number one, number two, number three, number four. And ask your questions, it's your only chance to have this man answering them. No questions? There's someone. No. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> number four. Hello, um, do you Hello. know why we are located in London? right now, when we use Google Maps here. Do you know, can you ask me again, do you know why we are located in London? Yes, here? when we use Google Maps, we are located in London. Do you know that? The Congress is located in London. Do you know why? I, I, I'm not aware. Okay. Yeah. I thought this was on plan. Okay. Thank you. Number one. Okay, so on uh, slide 12, you uh, showed this ang angle of arrival Can you methods. please be quiet? We can't understand the questions unless you are quiet. Sorry. Okay, Again. so on uh, slide 12, you showed the angle of arrival method um, executed by a drone. Um, is this a, a passive method or does it require some cooperation by either the phone company or by the targeted mobile phone? It, it can be conducted passively. Like if you call the phone or page the phone multiple times and you see which phone is answering the, this paging, and then the, or, okay, it's, it needs to be active in a way that, that, that you contact the phone, but, but you don't need an, MC, an active MC catcher for it. You, you just phone the, or call the phone, and then you see which phone is answering, and then uh, you know where the phone is situated. Thanks. Yeah. I see that we have a question over there, so um, can you just ask your question, please? Here? 
Yes, All number right. eight, please. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'd like to ask a question about uh, tracking unpowered mobile phones. I mean, you mentioned lots of methods for phones which are both, uh, which both have their batteries inserted and are actively operating. Could you elaborate a bit about the methods of tracking phones which uh, seem to be off, uh, turned off from the user's point of view and maybe also something about those who have their batteries removed? Actually, if you really turn off your phone over a long period, let's say a couple of months, I think you are safe. But, but uh, <laughs> if, if that's you... good to know. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, actually, like, like if if you have a base station and somebody is switching off his phone, and maybe he is meeting somebody else at that point, and somebody else is also switching off his phone, then then it can be suspicious. But but yeah, it really depends whether somebody is looking into this data or not. Thank you. Um, number eight again. Uh, I had a short question. Um, as you described, uh, we are somehow dependent on the good winning of um, the NSA, for instance. And I wanted to ask if there's some way to avoid uh, geolocation or use Google Maps without sending identity to... <laughs> Uh, uh, services. Th that is fairly difficult. Uh, I, I would assume that uh, GPS phones are a little bit better uh, to avoid geolocationing, especially if you add additional GPS spoofing, because uh, there the, the network cells are really large, and so it's more difficult you, to track you within the network cell. But, but if you have a drone right above you, and you emit a physical signal, and then the drone will always be able to localize where the signal came from. So, yeah, it's, it's difficult because it's physically difficult. Okay, thanks. Number one, please. So, I have a question about the physicalities of receiving a, or, or localizing, uh, localizing or making angular measurements of a phone within a, like, a densely populated area where there's possibly like tens of thousands of zones within the receptional area of a three-kilometer-high drone. Um, that would obviously require you to be more sensitive on one hand than this cell tower, and on the other hand also um, receive at the same time and sort out all kinds of interference. Mm -hmm. Usually a uh, cell can be between, let's say, 200 meters and uh, three, uh, or 30 kilometers in size. So, so, so three kilometers in altitude is, is not very high. So, for, so, for this so, so you assume that um, the drone does a pre-selection via whatever digital beam forming on the, on the ground path and, and only looks at a, a cell of interest because he, it knows from like, the network that it, it, the it, suspect is in that cell. It depends on the area, like in an urban area, you, you have to reduce the size of the cell, otherwise you would receive too many signals, but in a countryside, you can have larger cells, or you can cover a larger area. Um, regarding covering larger areas, um, did you take, considering that these drones aren't really like our quadcopter size, they're more like no, the, the, airpla they airplane sized, usually, yeah. um, or proper airplanes, um, did you take the, the classical synthetic aperture radar techniques of like observing something for a long time while flying straight over it and then integrating over it into, into account because that's usually where we get like our high resolution radar imagery of, of the Earth? You, you can conduct multiple measurements or you just uh, conduct one if you know that the target is on the ground. So yeah, so. but did that... Um, account for your um, estimation, uh, estimated no, accuracy? No, uh, it's not uh, necessary to integrate. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We have a question from the internet. Um, yes, um, the internet wants to know if there are attributes which you can change of the phone to stop surveillance, so attributes like the email, for example. Can you please repeat the question? Are there attributes of the phone which you can change to stop yeah, surveillance? Yeah, uh, certainly you, you can fake the email or the MC. That, that is also another reason why, why it's not 
sufficient um, to prove the identity because any phone can ju just fake this data. And we have a second question, which is, um, does the GSM network have a feature which allows anyone to get the GPS data from the phone? Mm. <laughs> yeah, it, it would be the, that, uh, the radio resource location service protocol. So, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, number five. Um, hello. Um, you delivered your work to the NSA Untersuchungsausschuss, yeah. and they, uh, the Bundestag did not say anything about it. But uh, is there a statement from the NSA Untersuchungsausschuss? And the government said something about it. They, they said that, um, that they washed their hands and said we, we did everything nicely because we added also a disclaimer to the data we provided and that the disclaimer says that the NSA is forced to, to stick to the German law and that they are not allowed to do whatever they want with this data. Thank you. Very nice. Number six, please. Hello. Um, on slide 12, you got you, you specified uh, accuracy of about five meters for two drones. So, how does it scale if you would use more than two drones? For example, no. ten or whatever. I think that there was a small misunderstanding. Oh. Actually, uh, one drone is uh, sufficient. Okay, so could you use more than one drone? Yeah, you, you can use as many as you want, but, but one is sufficient. Yeah, but that, <laughs> of course. But does the accuracy increase by using more than one? Yeah, if you go closer to, to the target, and then the accuracy increases. Okay, but with the same distance, but more than one drone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, 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 actually not. Okay, thank you. Number four, please. Um, also referring to the accuracies, you were talking about field experiments and so on. Did you conduct those uh, yourself, or where did you get all the information from? And th these are some references. Uh, there you can uh, ah, okay. uh, find the field oh. experiments. Thank you very much. Number two, please. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, my question is regarding the fingerprint uh, which you can use on many phones to, to unlock the phone. Um, is there currently, awesome. and if not, will there, or do you think there will be a possibility um, that, for example, an app which requires the fingerprint identification on the phone, that this is also passively read, and by that you increase the identification of persons? Did, did you understand the question? <sighs> Yeah, but, but, but I think this is like based on the GSM network and the, the other things that that's based on the operating system. So, so currently using this technology, there, there couldn't be, there, there, it's not possible to link this? No. Or not? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> okay, number one, please. My question is actually about the civil use of geolocation services, not so much about uh, phones. So you mentioned that every time you use an online service that uses geolocation, you send the SSIDs of nearby Wi-Fi networks. And with every request, you actually enrich an, a Wi-Fi map, a Wi-Fi database of either Google, if it's on Android, or Apple, if it's on iOS. Now, there was a talk at CCC here in 2009 when this technology was still nascent, and then back then it was called Skyhook. But then the speaker had this provocative question, shouldn't this Wi-Fi map be public domain instead of just uh, belonging, proprietary, and belonging either to Apple or Google nowadays? So haven't we lost that struggle? I mean, we can't keep our SSIDs private, so shouldn't it be public domain? Yeah, it would be a good idea to make a public domain, since also a lot of positive things can be created with this technology, like helping people in emergency situations. Okay, Anne. Hi. Um, I wanted to take the chance to say thanks for this talk. I'm one of the people who actually commissioned the analysis because I work in the inquiry. 
and uh, it was extremely helpful for us to have the analysis done because we, like you said, keep being confronted with secret service people who tell us that no way can mobile phone numbers uh, help in the secret uh, war. And yeah, so, yeah, thank just you. wanted to say thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Great. So, thank you also very, very much yeah. for your work and uh, keep on going with that.